Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here in such a beautiful setting. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to come. I know uh, some of you may have seen me back in March. Uh, I was in Denver for a Department of Education event, and actually as, as recently as last Monday in Atlanta, and I know there was a team uh, there from Colorado as well. Um, this work is very interesting. Um, when I, I spoke to, to Nina Lopez and talking about we're doing integration in Colorado. And I, in my position, uh, as you heard a little bit in the introduction, kind of give these talks about the standards and what they mean all, literally all over the country. And usually people don't even think about this concept of integration. It's like, and we have to do this, and we have to do that. And we have to do the other thing. And what I observe in Colorado, probably like no other place, is the idea that, yes, and this is quite an opportunity. Because could you imagine the idea of doing this work without the notion of integration? Uh, I can give you a very real example of this. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak know that in addition to all the stuff that w was mentioned in the bio about my school uh, experiences, I also have two children that are in elementary school this year. It gives me lots of good material. Uh, and I also have uh, my mother, who is still a third grade teacher. So my mother, who's a third grade teacher, as I began this work with the standards, you know, she did ask me very early on, are you going to become one of them, Sandra? You know, as we were talking about teacher effectiveness and really talking about impact of teaching, that was the question, you know, she kind of challenged me with. Uh, and then uh, she started giving me some insight about what common standards, what this common core looked like in her own school. And she said, you know, we have some administrators that are paying all of this money to go to these, you know, workshops, and we're not really getting any information back in the schools. I, I don't understand, so, you know, what's going on? And I keep telling, Mom, I'll fill you in. I'll tell you, you know, what there is to know. And, you know, the way she is, she's like, no, 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 talk to, you know, if you, I'm not gonna do this for you, Sandra. If you, you know, you wanna help, you should talk to the, the district administration, who I happen to know. And so just last week, I contacted um, the gentleman in the district who is in charge of professional development and also curriculum in the district. And I said, you know, listen, we haven't touched base for a while since I was at the State Department of Education. Here's what I'm doing now. Student Achievement Partners as an organization is a nonprofit. We don't accept any money for speaking. We don't sell anything. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So I said, you know, I know actually a lot about the standards. I work with the people who led the writing of the standards. And so if you want any help, you thinking about back to school kickoff events, you know, we can have a conversation. And I kid you not that his response was, yeah, we did that last year. Uh, this year we're working on teacher effectiveness. So thanks, but uh, no thanks. And I was like, wow. That really spoke a lot about the challenges um, that we have ahead of us with so many people thinking that this is just, you know, a one-time event, do a little curriculum alignment study, and you're done. So um, a little bit of background on the standards themselves that led to these common um, math and literacy standards. And I think very much part of the whole Colorado conversation about the Colorado academic standards across the content areas. It wasn't that people kind of thought around the country, you know what this country needs? We need a good set of standards. That is what the, this country needs. Rather, the challenge that was before us was, you know what our problem is right now? Not enough students, you know, it started off with not enough students completing high school. So that was, you know, kind of the, the topic in vogue, so to speak, for a few years where we talked about dropout factories and kids not persisting through high school. And then as the economy continued to tank, um, it became, well, guess what? Even if these kids earn diplomas, they're leaving our high schools not prepared to do a whole heck of a lot, whether they go on to a two-year college, a four-year college, uh, an apprenticeship in a trade, a technical training, scenario, they haven't been demonstrating much success. And so, you know, with the observations and learnings that a couple of the founding members of Student Achievement Partners, uh, David Coleman and Jason Zimba had from some of their previous work, 
It was, well, listen, here's what we're doing to teachers. We're giving them these huge, long lists of standards, if we want to call them that, expectations that they're supposed to teach, where even if they decided they were going to be compliant and try to teach everything in those documents, there was way too much. You could never teach it. Someone told me once a study was recently done of California standards, and it would take 33 years to teach everything that was in the California standards. And so people would say, so what? What's the big deal? So what's the big deal about that is that now teachers are forced to decide which of these things that are being told to me as a teacher are all really important. Which of these things do I do? And some teachers make that decision based on what they like to teach, what they know very well, what's on the state assessments, if they actually knew what was on the state assessments. And you have this situation where it makes the idea of improving student achievement very difficult. And so literally a conversation sparked to say, you know how we could really change student achievement in this country? If we had a set of expectations that were fewer in number, so when you get your list as a fourth grade teacher, these are a shorter list of things. They are deliverable. You know what the headlines are. You have a, an ability to, to grasp these things because it's not a volume document. I know when I was in New Jersey, we, uh, I worked at the state during the uh, consideration of the adoption of the Common Core. And previously, whenever I wanted to print out a copy of the standards, I literally had to put, you know, two weeks in advance, a special order for that really big paper, and how was I going to, which printer could handle printing that many standards, and what would that document look like? And when we were considering the adoption of the Common Core, it was one page for a grade, double-sided, six-point font, no margins, but we could fit it on one page, and, uh, you know, that in and of itself was quite, quite a move. Um, the idea is also that these were a set of standards that everybody could be clearer about. And by clearer, we mean you read these standards and you really know what's expected. It's not just that there are these vague statements like explore concepts of number. You know, they really describe um, much more than was typical before what performance looks like. And they were higher. And higher does not mean harder. It's one of the things that I kind of cringe every time I read the blogs and, you know, tweets and all of this stuff about the standards and about how we're going to be torturing kids and so on about raising expectations. What we mean by a set of higher standards is that when a standard is declared, we actually expect students to do it. And so if you think about the world around us outside of education, whether it's construction, uh, electricians, safety, they all have standards. And you couldn't imagine for a moment that you would go to the store and buy an appliance for your kitchen, and it says, you know, this appliance meets, you know, underwriters' laboratory standards for safety. And you think, like, some of those standards some of the time. Like, what it means to actually meet standards is you can say the third graders all meet the standard in third grade. And so that's what we mean by higher standards. You don't see all of the repetition that we typically saw in standards that preceded this. Because when you say in third grade, my you know, favorite example I keep going back to, next year it'll be fourth grade. My daughter just finished third grade this year. But in <laughs> third grade, when you say all kids can multiply within 100, you don't mean you know just the really bright kids in class, just the kids who were born good at math, you mean all kids in third grade by the time they finish can multiply within 100. And so that's what we mean by higher standards. So how did we get to that list of fewer, clearer, higher standards? How are we going to decide what made it in? And more importantly, what didn't make it into the list of standards? It had to be based on evidence. Typically, when standards were developed in every state, you know, you brought together all your stakeholders, the people you like, the people that you knew were going to complain a lot, and you put them together in a room and said, you know, we have until 3 o'clock to finish this. And what ended up happening is the way those meetings ended is to say, okay, you get what you want, you get what you want, you get what you want, and we just put it all in there, and thus these really long lists. Instead, these standards had to be grounded by some evidence of what students in fact need in order to be ready for college and career. So the idea of K-12 not being a stopping point but really being a springboard for preparation for life after high school 
is no longer a high school conversation. Uh, it's no longer a senior year of high school conversation. It is now a K-12 expectation. So that these are a set of standards about that. And most importantly, uh, for those of us that are, are still in the classroom and still doing this work uh, on the front lines, as we say, it is probably the first time I can recall where we start a real effort toward improving education by saying, there are some things we have to stop doing. Not one more thing to do. Like, by the way, is your plate already full? Because here's another initiative we're going to put on top of it. The most important move in these standards is to start thinking about time really honestly to say, in order to deliver on this, there are certain things that we just need to stop doing because they aren't grounded in evidence. They aren't preparing our kids. They're maybe entertaining our kids, maybe keeping our kids busy, but when time and money is a finite resource, we have to be really strict with ourselves about how we choose to spend the time if we're truly committed to this idea of all kids. Because it's easy enough to just say, you know, I won't do the all kids thing, and I'll do all the topics that I possibly can do. But when you are really focused on outcomes, that's an important part. So from Student Achievement Partners, um, we have really um, focused on this messaging of the standards in the framework of major shifts. So what we'll go for over now, if you can think of it as kind of describing the forest for the trees, it's not everything that's in the standards, but if you understand this, these shifts, and there are three in literacy and three in math, you really get the headline of the standards. So often in, in the world of education reform, we have a three-step process to change. Step one, get ready for, this, for the change. Step two, fire, start doing things. And step three, aim. And so what I, what I think Colorado is doing an excellent job with, what this is all about, really understanding the standards first, is ready. I know you guys are ready. I know your state has been, been hard at work with this. Ready, we're there. Now we have to figure out what it is we're aiming at so that when we do fire, when we do this stuff in classrooms, when we bring this stuff to our students, we know what good looks like. We know what are the activities that are out there in this marketplace sea of opportunity for help. We know what to do. And so that's really where we come with these three shifts. Even the, the authors of the standards themselves will tell you not to look at the individual grain size of each standard first. You won't get the big picture. So, so that's the, the point. And we'll go through these shifts and some examples um, of them. And then uh, when we do the Gettysburg Address lesson at the end, you'll really see these things come to life. So the first um, shift in the literacy standards is this idea of building knowledge from content-rich nonfiction. And so what this means is that, again, thinking about college and career readiness, thinking about even changes to the national assessment, the NAEP assessment, there needs to be a better balance between stories and nonfiction. Nowhere today or any other time did I or any members of Student Achievement Partners say we will no longer be reading stories. It's one of those myths that just gets promulgated out there. But in kindergarten through fifth grade, about half of what kids are reading should be nonfiction. I know in you know, the East Coast, my kids' school, the schools that I worked in, as we you know, got into these high accountability tests, we expanded our literacy blocks across the country. And what we did as a result of that is we crowded out science and social studies from the elementary curriculum. So you know, in my mother's lesson plans, the lesson plans when I was a principal in an elementary school, you know, we teach science on Thursdays for four weeks, and then we teach social studies on Thursdays for four weeks, and we spend a lot of time in literacy. And what the research shows us is that about 80% of what kids read in elementary school literacy blocks is stories. And so what this shift is requiring is that they start reading more nonfiction, but not just as an exercise, like here is a true story, boys and girls, but what we're talking about is actually using that text as a source of information. So when you're learning about bats, dinosaurs, the planets, um, you know, presidential elections, all those things that you can imagine that elementary school teacher, students learn about, communities and social studies and that kind of thing, you're starting to read text 
in an increasingly complex way it's, as the concepts develop, the text develops, and kids are actually starting to learn concepts, knowledge from what they read. In grades 6 to 12, this changes a bit because now if you've seen the standards in literacy, you know that they include standards for literacy in science, standards in literacy for history and social studies. They're not just English language arts. And so what that means, you know, I was a science teacher, is that the work of science, hugely dependent on being literate, hugely dependent on reading, writing, speaking, analyzing text. Do I want English teachers to teach kids how to read a science journal? No, I think that's the job of a science teacher. Not because I'm helping out my colleague in the English department, but in order to enhance understanding of my content area, my students need to know how to read and write in the discipline. So starting in sixth grade, students in social studies classes, science classes, they need to start using the text, not as just like an external reference, but actually as a source of information. I often, you know, reflect back, you know, every time you leave a job, you think about how much better you could have done when you had that job. So did I have text in my high school science classroom? Of course I did. Did I assign and expect my students to read the science textbook? Of course I did. Why? So that they could pay attention when I lectured them the next day. Not ever as a source of information. I mean, really. If they asked me a question during my lecture, did I ever refer them back to the text as a source of information? No way. I gave them the answers. I love to do that. That's why I teach, right? You love to do what I'm doing now, tell these stories, you know, fill people in. Um, but the move here is that if you're thinking about college career readiness, you know, being a productive member of society, it's this idea of giving a text, find that as a source of information, and build knowledge from that. The second one is reading, writing, and speaking that's grounded in evidence from the text. So you can imagine that students are, are reading fiction, nonfiction, either one, and that they're asked to do things in response that, in fact, don't require they have read this. And we do this all the time. So um, great examples. I was uh, watching my nieces and nephews uh, last year. My niece was a junior in high school assigned to read Beowulf. Uh, my sister didn't tell me she had a project to do over the weekend, but her project for Beowulf is that she had to build a three-dimensional um, model of a meat hall. And that was her culminating project for reading Beowulf. And so I love doing those things, and we went and we built it, and she got an A. And I can't even tell you if she read the book or not. And this is the kind of activity that we constantly do with kids because we don't think about did you have to read the text in order to answer that question? And so this move of text-based questioning is something that you can imagine in your implementation plans to happen kindergarten through 12th grade. So you read a story out loud to a kindergarten class, and you have choices about the questions and the discussions that kids have in response to that. You can talk about things that happen to them personally kind of related to that story. And there's a place for that. I'm not saying don't do that in kindergarten. But there's also a way you can start asking kids to pull evidence from the text of what they're reading in order to answer these questions. You know, um, we have a lot of examples and a lot of examples of when this doesn't happen. Um, and I'll show you some of those test questions that I think really bring this to light. The third of the three shifts in literacy, I believe, is the most challenging because I think it changes practice the most. So in the evidence that informed the development of the standards, we looked at what students had to read in college and careers, and we knew from ACT studies and other sources um, that a great, great predictor of student success or not uh, in college and careers had to do with their ability to read complex text. And by complex text, we mean not just you know, um, the, the vocabulary, the sentence structure, the concepts of what they're reading. All of that kind of comes together to make uh, a particular text complex. And what they were expected to read post-secondary, there was a huge gap 
between that and what students were actually reading in high school. So it was a bit of a debate in the development of these standards that they would in fact not just be a set of standards that included skills, but actually, actually skills in relation to a particular complexity level of text. So you can imagine that once we determine what that level of text students needed to read after high school what, excuse me, was, that we would back it down to high school, back it down to what they need to read in middle school, you know, upper elementary school and elementary school, so that there is a staircase in the standards of what students should be reading. Very different than this idea that students are always reading at their own level, that's a very common practice now. And so what this shift and the standards require is more practice with on grade level complex text. So are students struggling readers? Yes, we didn't create a magic wand and say now everybody's on grade level. But what we're saying is that in order for students to be on grade level readers, they need to practice with on grade level material. Because the things that make text complex vocabulary, sentence structure, and so on, are actually absent from lower level text. So you can imagine the situation that we're putting these kids in to say, you can't be an on grade level text because you don't have the vocabulary, you can't you know, kind of comprehend these more complex structures, so we're not gonna make you do that. The idea is that all the scaffolding strategies that should be going on should be doing everything short of replacing the text, the kinds of questions you ask students, the, the vocabulary words that you choose to focus on or not focus on, all different ways to scaffold without saying, you know, the bluebirds are gonna read this story, you know, the robins are gonna read that story and so on. We're saying that in order to get good at complex text, everyone needs an opportunity to read complex text. That's a huge change in practice and one that I think Schools need to pay a lot of attention to, share a lot of conversations about what do you do. You still can have separate groups working on the same text, and there still is a role um, for building fluency and volume of reading and that kind of thing with texts closer to students' comfort level, but when you talk about where you're spending your energy and your time as a teacher, it's really getting more students practicing with complex text all the way up uh, through high school, and we'll uh, do more of that this afternoon with, with the example. So just some uh, illustrations to kind of put a pin in this. Um, I was a high school teacher, as I've said several times now, and I was at a presentation a couple weeks ago, and this is a great example because somebody gave it to me, which I love. Um, when I started working at Student Achievement Partners, we started thinking about all the examples that we could develop, and we had this idea that we would come up with some science examples. What is a text? that we could read in a science classroom that would really illustrate what we're talking about in the shifts. And so I will tell you that part of it is textbooks. We're not saying that science teachers need to, you know, pour out in the world around them and find all of these other sources of text. There are other sources of text, certainly, but certainly don't discount the fact that you could do close reading of textbooks as well. But one of the things, and having been a biology teacher, is that both James Watson, and Francis Crick, who are the two people who are credited with discovering the structure of DNA, wrote really interesting memoirs and accounts of what it was like to discover DNA. And so we thought that that would be one example that we would um, tackle. Um, it was a bit too challenging at the time, and we were really busy doing Gettysburg Address and other things, so we kind of put it on the back burner. But someone gave me um, a page out of a biology textbook where they actually excerpted part of Watson's memoir, where he talked about the discovery of DNA, which I was like, great. Now we're having complex text right in the biology textbook. This is what we want kids to be reading. And then this is the prompt that students answer in response to reading that complex text. James Watson used time away from his laboratory and a set of models similar to preschool toys to help him solve the puzzle of DNA. In an essay, discuss how play and relaxation help promote clear thinking and problem solving. Do you see how this isn't text dependent at all? Like, not, every one of us could probably write that essay, right? I would venture to say not many of us have, written, have read Watson's book, 
right? So this is the move that we need to start thinking about. From our perspective at Student Achievement Partners in the recommendation mode, we think this idea of asking students text-based questions or evidence-based questions is a great first move. K-12, science, social studies, English language arts, we could just start doing that even with the texts that we're currently reading and it's a great um, move to make. Some uh, sources of information, we have a, a website that just launched in February called achievethecore.org. And so just to show you what that website is, there's basically three areas of the website, steal these tools, you've got to read this, which is just research articles and things that other people are write, re writing about the standards, and then a section that we're continuing to, to think about how to enhance, which is by teachers for teachers. So under the seal these tools button, there are close reading exemplars, many of them, about nine or 10 of them now, um, and those will continue to be added as, as they're developed. And you can use them, download them, change them, whatever you want. It's a good source, and, and we'll look at one of those exemplars um, very closely uh, later today. Another great tool that we have on this website is this notion of text-dependent questions. There is actually um, a project going on, um, our organization with the Council of Great City Schools, where we're taking things that are commonly read, the basal readers, for example, in elementary school, and rewriting the questions that go along with it so that we can communicate. You don't have to buy new things. The texts in those things aren't necessarily that bad but it's what we're doing in response to that text that really needs to change in order for it to be aligned to the standards. And so about 150 teachers around the country are right now working on this. We're getting ready to launch a website where anybody could go on this website, get these units, get these questions, get these lessons. And um, this section of the website on text-dependent questions has um, professional development resources for how do you teach somebody to write a really good question, what are some ways that you can evaluate the questions that you're asking kids now to determine whether that's a good question or not. And just to kind of elevate the anxiety, ease the anxiety, I'm not sure which one, for the science and social studies teachers out there who are doing this work, just keep in mind that your typical high school English teachers didn't go to college to learn how to do this either. I mean, they are focused mostly on literature, and so this idea of how to teach kids to read closely and write in response to text isn't the typical work uh, for them either, so these sources are, are very good um, for that. And then the third thing that's also on the Steal These Tools website that I would point you to look toward is something that we have developed called the Publisher's Criteria. Uh, student Achievement Partners, um, which was very instrumental in writing these standards, committed from its onset that we would never make money off selling anything that you needed in order to implement these standards. So uh, rather than write a textbook series, our goal, quite frankly, is to improve every textbook that's out there. By creating a set of criteria that districts, states and so on that the, the field, the, the consumer, so to speak, will know how to demand of the publishers. We really want to change the market. So they created a set of publishers criteria uh, in literacy. The math ones are, are going to be released uh, in the next month or so, so that people developing textbooks know that rather than just putting an emblem on the cover that says it's common core aligned, that there's actually something that has to happen between the cover to make it Common Core aligned. And so this is a set of criteria that I would encourage all of you to look at because it's another way of describing what resources look like uh, that are well aligned to these standards. Uh, so moving on to math quickly. Um, in literacy, we talked about three uh, shifts. And whether you want to do the first one first, the second one first, do them all at the same time, doesn't matter too much. There's a lot of difference of opinion about that. Um, we usually kind of think about doing the second one first because you don't have to buy anything, change anything as far as resources. It's just what you do in response. Uh, in math, however, there is no question, debate, discussion that you cannot deliver on these math standards if you do not first focus your expectations in math. So you've probably heard description of math in this country as being a mile wide, inch deep. 
In literacy, I talked about one of the ways we scaffold for kids is give them different levels of complexity of what they read. In math, what we do when kids are struggling is we just go on to the next topic. So kids are struggling with fractions, don't worry, Monday we're learning how to tell time. We, we just race through it, and as teachers, we have every excuse in the book because we don't have to worry about lingering on a topic that kids struggle with. And um, you know, I can't tell you how closely I observe this with my own kids' work at home, that it's just a mile a minute, concept by concept, and starting, my, my youngest just finished first grade, we teach math as if it's not supposed to make sense, just because we don't have time. We don't have time for it to make sense. So the idea here is that we are actually focusing. And this isn't a bad idea. I mean, oftentimes we've said, you know, no child left behind has caused us to narrow the curriculum, and that's often been characterized as a bad thing. We're not talking about focus by cutting out the arts, science, social studies. Focus in math brings richness, deepness, because your depth, deepness, depth, because you have fewer things that you're working on, you can get um, more in depth with those things. And so a couple of visuals, this is what math looks like typically uh, across the country. So whether you're in kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, somehow somebody came up with the idea that everybody needs the same thing. Numbers and operations, patterns and algebra, um, geometry and measurements, statistics and probability. We do some of that every year K-12. There is no question when I go around the country and I ask elementary school teachers, which of these do you think should be your area of focus? What do you think they say? Numbers and operations. Okay, good, I'm still at 100% response rate. Nobody, nobody's argued with me yet. Numbers and operations, but if you look at a typical early elementary curriculum, you can't tell that that's the area of emphasis because you're obligated, we often call these the shopping aisles, you're obligated to put things in your cart from each and every one of these aisles so that when you look at the totality of the first grade curriculum, it's in there, but it's certainly not the area of focus. And what we mean by focus, of course, is that every kid having a chance to really work on this topic to the point that they feel confidence and that they feel ready to go with this. So instead, what the standards look like is more like this picture, where there's a shape to math. You concentrate on operations in early grades and you build up so that the, by the time the kids get to eighth grade and beyond, you're actually working on real algebra going forward. So a couple of things kind of focusing a bit more on middle school and high school. This is a very interesting slide. You probably can't read it very well from the back of the room, but the tall bar graph, which says 89% of high school math instructors feel that their students graduate high school prepared for college math, 89%. College professors, when surveyed about whether students that enter college are in fact prepared for math, is 26%. There is a significant gap here. And just to go through, you know, this means lots and lots of remediation. Most kids who enter in remediation don't graduate. That is a stark reality. It's true. As we kind of adopt this political movement to send more kids to college, that's not the challenge. Getting kids into the door in college isn't the challenge. Getting kids to successfully complete credit-bearing courses is the challenge, and math is a huge, huge barrier uh, to that. So I'm just gonna kind of skip through some of these. This is um, a, a quick graph that shows you, like we can be adult about this. It seems like for a while we were very hesitant to say some things are more important than others. Like what would happen if we actually admitted that? It's true, <laughs> some things are more important than others. Doesn't mean some things that are less important shouldn't be taught and we just take it off the plate. But if I'm a teacher and my students are struggling with some of these, and this is um, from a study that was done with college professors where we labeled, numbered each of the expectations in math. So the first group of um, expectations is algebra, then functions, the low is geometry, and then number and quantity, and statistics and probability at the end. If I'm a teacher, this is what the colleges are telling me kids need in order to be successful. 
I'm going to teach the things that are on the high bar with a little bit different intensity and energy than struggling with kids who are doing really poorly in geometry. I only have so much time and so much energy. I want my kids to get strong at the things that matter most. So that's, that's the message, and this is just a different representation of that. Of course, in the math standards, we also have these math standards for practice, which are very important in middle school and high school, particularly um, applications. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these. The second two shifts, we have coherence in math, which basically means math is supposed to make sense. We take opportunities to connect topics within the grade, and we take the opportunity to connect topics across grades. So for example, in elementary school, when kids are learning how to do those bar graphs where the scale is 5, 10, 15, we can reinforce concepts of multiplication where we say five times as many, 10 times as many, and so on. So thinking across grades and linking those things. Very important that we used to think, maybe some of us still do, that the way you get really strong at high school math is start taking algebra like in seventh grade. Just start it all earlier. You'll do better. In fact, research shows us that there's certain concepts in math that if kids don't get them, they're not going to do well in high school math. And in particular, fractions, the one that we always avoid. Research shows us that when kids have a strong foundation in fractions, they do better in algebra. So rather than giving them algebra in sixth, seventh grade, let's make them really strong in fractions in sixth and seventh grade, and it will play out to, to further success in high school and beyond. And finally, the third of the three shifts in math is this concept of rigor. We are no longer debating what's more important, that kids know the answer or that they know the concept. There are three elements to knowing math, and they're all expected in the standards. First, you have to understand the concepts. This is a subject area. It's not just about how to get the answer quickly. It's about understanding the concept. Secondly, we have the idea that there are some things that kids just need to be fast with. They need to be accurate with. They need to be fluent with. Can you imagine if we were still teaching kids decoding skills up through high school when they read? You just need to be fluent with a few things in math. And then finally, there is the necessity that students are able to apply their math to uh, real world applications. And the idea, if you can think about it, is how do you get good? I'll make sure you have, how do you get good at problems like this, which is an application problem? A, you see a problem like this every day. Or B, you understand well the concept of percentage, you understand well the procedural fluency of multiplying and so on, so that you can apply that to these kinds of problems. So all three of those things go together to paint what, what we expect from math. And this is just a little excerpt um, that I'll make sure you guys have access to this PowerPoint, because it's talking about what we don't want to do. It. And I'm going to, even though I'm running a little bit over here, I'm going to just read this to you, because I think it applies to your whole concept of integration to begin with. You have just purchased an expensive Grecian urn and asked the dealer to ship it to your house. He picks up a hammer, shatters it into pieces, and explains that he will send you one piece a day in an envelope for the next year. You object. He says, don't worry. I'll make sure that you get every single piece and the markings are clear so you'll be able to glue them all back together. I've got it covered. Absurd, no? But this is the way many school systems require teachers to deliver mathematics to their students. One piece, one standard at a time. They promise their customers, the taxpayers, that by the end of the year, they will have covered the standards. So this idea of seeing the urn, I think, relates not just to the math standards, also to the literacy standards, not just to implementation of the standards, but the work you're doing with leadership, teacher effectiveness, all of that. If you can think of this as one big picture and all of this work fitting together, it would make little sense to shatter this into a million pieces and think that when you glue it together, it would make sense. So I, I leave that um, as, as kind of like a lasting image that I hope you have in your mind as you're doing this work. The idea of thinking about the big picture and putting all the pieces together to make something more meaningful 
more beautiful than the individual pieces um, might mean uh, separately. We'll have more time uh, later this afternoon, uh, and I know I'm, I'm running a little bit, uh, just two minutes, but a little bit late in time, and so um, I know there's uh, another speaker following me, so I don't want to step on his uh, speaking time. So I will talk to you all later this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>